Welcome everyone to this uh, community call, which is the last one in March for the Inner Source Commons. Um, these community calls are where we all gather together to have great discussions and hear from our participants and community members um, to discuss the topics that are important to you. This particular topic, um, I, I think is fantastic because it was actually suggested only about two calls ago from one of our participants to say that wouldn't it be great if we heard some little more about um, the topic of how do you build community around Inner Source projects. And I am delighted to welcome here today three fantastic speakers who will be sharing their point of view. That's Sheila, Georg and Isabel, if you'd like to wave. At this point, I might ask folks who are not speaking um, as part of the, the actual event, if you can turn off your camera for the moment, that will help us in our recording because we will be recording the first part of this session and making it available to folks who couldn't make it in person afterwards. So just to also say a big thank you to our partners and our supporters here in Intersource Commons. Um, Everyone who is listed here uh, helps make all our activities and events happen um, and we are very grateful to them indeed. And just a little plug, if anyone else would like to help support Inner Source Commons, please do feel free to reach out to us. This is how the, the, the general uh, flow of this event goes. The first part will be recorded and shared afterwards on YouTube for everyone to see. The second part, and I will make an artificial, <coughs> excuse me, uh, interruption about halfway through. Um, and the second part will be held under Chatham House rules. That's the part of the call which will not be shared afterwards. And it means that everyone can actually um, uh, ask the questions that maybe they wouldn't want to have recorded. Um, and we can all uh, have a safe space to have discussions uh, whatever discussions we'd like. If, for those of you who are not familiar with Chatham House rules, it means that participants are free to use the information they receive um, in the call freely, but you can't actually confirm the identity or the affiliation of speakers unless you check with them first. So that's what we would ask you please to do. Um, and that's the end of, of, my, of my share. So I will stop sharing here. Um, and I will First of all, get everyone to introduce themselves so we can say hi. I'll start actually because I've just realized that I haven't introduced myself, but my name is Claire Dillon. I'm the Executive Director in Inner Source Commons um, and I'm delighted to be here. And maybe I can pass over to Georg. Would you like to start and, and introduce yourself? I'm going around my screen here. Yes, hi, my name is Georg Blink. I'm the Director of Sales at Biturgia and I'm also a co-founder of the Chaos Community. Um, at IEEE SA Open, I help with as the lead of the community advisory group. And coincidentally, right now I'm teaching a course at Brandeis University in the open source technology management program on cultivating communities. And if I may introduce, a, make a small plug, there's a second course that starts in, I think, three weeks about integrating open source communities with the corporate strategies. So if anyone is interested, let me know. I'm happy to get you a discount if you want. Thank you for that, Georg. No one will be surprised to hear that that wasn't a coincidence at all. And that, that's exactly why we're delighted to have you here. So, so thank you for that. Um, Sheila, would you like to say hello? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sheila Sabi, and I, uh, I work at Comcast in the Open Source Program Office. I've been on that team for a little bit over five years, and we've been doing inner source for, I want to say, roughly three to four years now. Um, I'm also a CNCF ambassador, and I recently joined the steering committee of the To Do Group, Talk Openly and Do Openly, uh, under the Linux Foundation. Um, <clears throat> Thank you so much, Sheila. Um, Isabel, would you like to say hello? Hello, my name is Isabel Trost from, I'm president of the InnoSource Com Commons, and I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation. So from that time at Apache, a lot of my community building originates, and I'm happy to share anything that you would like to hear. Thank you, Isabel. Now we've all introduced ourselves, but while we are all talking, um, we'd really welcome it if, if you all introduce yourselves to each other in the chat stream. So if, if everyone would like to say hello in the chat stream and share uh, where they're from and their background, that's always a really great way for us all to get to know each other. So you can be busy doing that while we chat um, and then we'll also come to any questions that you might have there later in this session. So thank you for that. So let's get started. Okay, so about community building. I think one of the main 
main themes that always comes up here is the idea that if you have a project that you want to inner source and folks um, are really from the latest survey, we know that a lot more people are actually now making their code visible internally. But this kind of leap from just making your code visible to other people to actually getting external contributions to code from a really vibrant community seems to be a relatively hard kind of transition for some people. So what we're going to start with is, is let's just hear your top tip for how do you kickstart an external community of contributors to your project? Who would like to go first? I can go. Um, I have an example. Uh, so we had an inner source project, which is now open source, so I can talk about it. It's called Vinyl DNS. Uh, but prior to it going open source, um, it was a project that was maintained by maybe four or five people. And um, it was widely used across our organization. Uh, thousands of technologists were using it. So they didn't have enough bandwidth to maintain this project and to make updates. They could maintain it, but to make updates, et cetera. One of the ways we kickstarted um, that community was we, we had a consultation with the team. We pitched the idea of InnerSource and we also used it as a kind of a test bed project um, to see if InnerSource even is a good idea. Does it work? Um, one of the, and, and what we found was that there were a lot of users and there were a lot of issues that were filed, but there wasn't actually contributions coming in. Um, so it kind of, kind of to kickstart the whole community, uh, culture change needed, needed to happen and we needed to make sure that people knew it was okay to contribute back. And so um, this is kind of like a very manual, tedious, uh, tedious way of doing it, but we, we compiled a list of the users, um, especially ones that you know, heavily rely on this project. And we reached out to each of them and said, hey, uh, we noticed you filed an issue. Um, I noticed you're a big active user of this project curious if uh, you'd be interested in doing the pull request yourself um, and then making the change we encourage it what we found that was that a lot of people didn't know that it was okay to do so and so actually reaching out individually to those users and saying hey it's okay you can collaborate and communicate and uh, contribute back um, was a good way for us to kickstart like one of our inner source communities for one of our projects that's brilliant. Just ask. <laughs> it seems like yeah. such a simple thing to do, but probably a lot of people are sitting back going, why aren't people just coming to me? But I love that idea. Thank you so much, Sheila. Isabel, how about you? What would you recommend? Um, I think my recommendation goes into the same um, general direction as Sheila's. And what, what she described uh, is a very important component, which is that you need a large user base to draw your contributors from. So you, as a very first step, you have to make sure that your component is actually useful to people. To people, And then as the second step, communicate that it's okay to contribute. What I've also found with open source, it's typical that you already have established communication channels. Like where do you go in order to learn about what's next for the project? Where do you go in order to communicate with people? And oftentimes internally, this is something that first you have to establish as part of your culture change. And the other things I've, that I've also learned in open source is that sometimes um, development best practices differ a little bit. Maybe you use a different build system on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe you lose, use a different code style or a different language even. Now, a lot of those things are typically kind of standardized inside of organizations, but still there are differences between teams and between departments. So you want to make sure that A, you use a, say, build system that a lot of people know, so that they don't feel intimidated starting. But you also want to make sure to at least write down the first step-by-step -step guide, which where, where you have the first um, things that you have to know in order to get started. And so this can be really basic stuff. That's brilliant. Thank you, Isabel. Um, I left Georg last so he can rate us all afterwards. No, I'm, I'm only messing. That. <laughs> Georg, uh, from your course, what, what have we not yet covered in terms of how to kickstart the community project? So to, to build a community, um, especially a community of practice, we need three things. And we already talked about two of them. Sheila talked about getting the people, inviting them, and building the community and making the ask, hey, come on, it's okay, we'll help you. And then Isabel talked about the practices and establishing how we work together, step-by-step -step instructions. Here's how we actually contribute and sharing that. 
The third component to a successful community of practice is domain. We need to have a clear understanding of what is in scope and what is out of scope so that we can say, okay, we are all working towards this goal, this platform, these are the features, this is the architecture, and we are organizing around that. And we can say, hey, this idea is really good, but maybe that is a plugin, a module, or this is a custom integration that you do, um, but it will not become part of the project. Okay, brilliant. So clarity around these the, the, the scope of what's expected for contributions can also can also really help. And um, I, I want to come back to one of the things that was said earlier in terms of this, you know, the idea of having a very large user uh, community. Um, and, and it's just to, 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 to question, is it always necessary to have that large user community? I know that in other instances, we've heard of some projects who, who can sometimes get inner source projects kickstarted by perhaps pre-agreeing a kind of a collaboration maybe between two groups. And it wouldn't necessarily mean that there might be a huge user community that you're going to. Are, are there other patterns for that kind of, you know, who are the users or who are potential contributors that, that we might be able to explore as well, other than it has to be an incredibly popular project to begin with? One of our um, criteria. So what we do is when we when a team wants to onboard for inner source or they have a project in mind, we do a consultation with them. And during that consultation is when I ask if this project is going to be useful for more than one team. So I know everybody has different requirements. We don't necessarily require a huge user base, but we do ask that, you know, uh, you're thinking about this project expanding outside of your scope and and it, it is useful for more than one team. And that's kind of like our first, you know, gateway question and in, into seeing if if it would be a good fit for inner source. And and in terms of um when we think about the the uh the idea of actually I suppose assessing the suitability. Um, do, do you find, and in your experiences for, for inner source projects, um, are there often changes that need to be made, like the, as in pre work that needs to be done or planning that needs to be done in order to make them like the, the perfect inner source project that would be, be for better use for, for other, other teams? Is that often built into the planning or can it be kind of? plugged in at the end, if, if you know what I mean, in, in your in your experience. Um, I'll jump in and then I'll let everybody else because I don't want to take up everything. Um, but yes, so we ask for a clear README, contributed guideline, um, make sure to put uh, write down the list of current maintainers so that we have it um, written and then a project description and to let folks know at the very top of the, you know, GitHub Enterprise or whatever tool you're using banner um, to say that contributions are welcome. So those are the those are the minimum requirements that we have plus more than one team being interested. Brilliant. Thank you, Sheila. Gayo, how about you for the, for this one? What 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 do you think is is necessary to make something inner sourceable in this context or or or, <laughs> or how, how would you assess that? I I would advise to check for where is interest in actually collaborating together? Um, because if it's a project, like Shah said, that only one team is interested in, then we don't need to open it up for outside contributions. And to, to tie that in with your previous question for starting a community, it doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't need to be uh, already have, doesn't need to be a project that already has a lot of users but we need to see the potential for a lot of users. Um, and it could even start out without any technology, just as, okay, we're starting to build this. Everyone has a shared interest. We define the domain of what needs to be done, and then we actually start working on it. Okay, fantastic. How about you, Isabel, in, in, in terms of other checks you might put in place? So what we made good experience with is using the uh, maturity model patterns that we have on the inner source commons because some things that I found we started with the same minimum requirements that Sheila described but then um, going forward we noticed that people were unaware of the attentional load that for instance mentoring new contributors can bring onto the team 
and people were also unaware of the change that they need to make to their communication, like moving project specific communication on a project specific channel. So putting, ma making teams who want to innovate something and have that in, uh, in a shared ownership, making them go through the majority model, showed them that it's not only about the code, it's not only about the communication, but it's also about collaboration and communication. And that helped teams make a better informed decision about whether they want to innovate something in a shared ownership um, governance model or if they only want to open up the code and accept, for instance, issues from other teams, but nothing else. So again, clarity on that and knowing exactly the scope of what you're looking for and what you're aiming for is, and, and to share that, in fact, so everyone's clear about it is incredibly important. So that's really, really useful. Um, and I noted that a couple of times already we've pointed out kind of differences between, for example, the open source scenario and inner source. Like, for example, you can assume, you know, Isabel, you pointed out that you can assume that there are communications channels already in place for open source projects that may not be the same in, internally in organizations. Um, are there other kind of differences there between the idea of, of, of the challenge in terms of actually building a community for an open source project versus an inner source project or the other way around? So as you mentioned, my name, I'll get started this time. Um, of course, one of the most obvious differences is that the audience that you have internally is much smaller compared to open and where it's globally and worldwide. But also, if you look at traditional open source projects, they may use the same tooling that you have internally, but they use it differently. What do I mean by that? If you look at an issue tracker in an open source project, you put issues there and typically you have really, really lengthy discussions on how the, how the features should be built, um, all of the sideways, everything that could go wrong. Now, if you look at your typical corporation, typically they have some kind of um, HR process rolled out and if you listen to HR coaches or if you listen to specific talks, sometimes they tell you that issues in an issue tracker that you use for um, planning sessions should be tiny. So that it's cheap to throw them away. And this goes straight um, orthogonal to what we do in open source. I found this to be one of the major sources for misunderstandings because sometimes we use the same tooling we use the same name for the same tooling, but we use it in different, slightly different ways. And in, in open source and also in inner source, the, the um, focus is very much on written communication, which can be archived, which can be searched. Whereas in your average corporation, you don't have that focus so much on written communication. So that's also one source of misunderstanding. So should we have a bigger focus on, on, on that asynchronous like documentation of things? Sorry, and I missed the reason why they want to keep it short. Can you, can you explain that? What, what the justification is from HR to say, keep them short? Is that just because uh, we know so, so much? We don't want to... So it, it's, it's, so I want to listen to a, a, con, a presentation about how to do backlogs and how to do that in an issue tracker. Like the typical system you would use is Jira, but you can use any system. And they argued against long backlogs. And the reason to keep those stories very short is because it's cheaper to throw them away. Okay. Because you haven't, you haven't put too much work into I it. See. And if you already have written down so much, and if you've already um, worked so much out, then it's much harder to throw them away. Okay, so, so, it, so there's, a, there's a tension a, there a, between between yeah. how much investment you put in into the documentation of it. But I can only assume because we, we certainly know from from discussing in other in other um, calls and things like that that the the the, the benefit of having a docu yeah. documentation on your issues in inner source can be really beneficial because there is so much assumed knowledge in in internal organizations that that you forget is assumed knowledge and and then it really helps with onboarding and with people churn when you do have the, the documentation available um, through the inner source uh, process. So I'm assuming that that's a kind of a balance. Not really. What they were talking about is issues that are open for a very long time. I mean, you've likely also seen it in engineering where you have a backlog, which is extremely long and where you have issues on products that are already out of scope, which right. are not, no longer, and those you can totally throw away. And for them, it's easier to throw them away if they are very short. Gotcha. But that, that's just a different way of using your issue tracker, essentially. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. No, thank, thank you as well. Georg, how about your, from your perspective? So you're, you're, you're teaching the course on the, on the, from the open source perspective um, primarily, but do you, do you feel that there's differences in, the, in that inner source approach that can be called out? Uh, one thing that I always think about is the culture in the community. And when you set up a community within an organization, you inherit the culture of the organization with that. And you want to be mindful of that. When you set up a open source community or you join an open source community, it's much more many different people with different backgrounds coming together and building that culture is, is going to be a, quite a different process. And the reason this is important is because the culture is how we, how we interact with each other, the, keeping things short or long, explaining yourself a little bit more, maybe in open source, uh, but also using like acronyms and shortcuts in the communication, which in open source we know can create a lot of friction and people coming in who are not familiar with the culture yet are, are left out because they may not understand it. It's harder to get in. And within organizations that might be a little easier if that's already established as part of the organizational culture. That's, um, I think that that's a great point. And, and one of the things that has come up before um, is, is not just the, the context of the organization you're working in and how you inherit their principles and values, but also um, the potential assistance you might be able to have if you can somehow build in kind of norms of behavior or, or formally include like education as part of your organizational rollout. And, and I think it points to some organizations who have formal inner source program offices or open source program offices whose job it is to help people. I mean, Sheila, you mentioned, and I think you're sitting somewhere where you formally help people do, in, do inner source. So I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll ask that next. So, you know, for, if you were, we, we can assume that there are a lot of additional helps you can, you can uh, provide if you're in a formal program office, but if you are not in a formal program office or you don't have the influence to be able to impact like top down, you know, dictates or anything like that not that we're suggesting that that's how you do it but but if, but if you're if you're if you're purely someone who's who's doing this from a grassroots perspective wanting to get an experiment started in your organization um what would be a tip for them so you may not have access to for example company-wide communications or things like that are there other methods or practices or patterns that that you might be able to to propose for people in that instance anyone um, so we have, uh, we have a, so our, our program, we have an official open source program office, but the inner source program hasn't really, um, we don't have like OKRs and goals around it as of um, today, but we do have leadership buy-in. So it's kind of a grassroots uh, initiative uh, paired with a little bit of uh, organization. Uh, but one of the things that is really, um, it really helps um, get things uh, basically kick things off without that is having allies and people that are advocates for open source or inner source. Um, so we were able to find folks that are passionate about inner source. One example is like Faye. Um, she's part of the, the inner source commons community. Um, so, you know, finding she, she's, um, she's, for example, on one of our architecture teams. So reaching out to her and seeing if she's on board, if she knows any projects that that would be a good fit. We did a lot of that um, finding allies. And we also we also um, paired up with the open source ambassador program. So we have ambassadors that sit all across the world uh, within our organization and they help us with inner source as well. So we basically train them and say, hey, come to us if you know of any inner source projects. So that's kind of been our grassroots approach um, paired with a lot of internal marketing. I love that. Like, I mean, you know, so, so, so many people kind of feel that that has to like be part of a formal role, but essentially just the intentional reach out to like-minded people and the, the making those connections. I mean, it, it's so helpful no matter what you're trying to do in terms of change management. So yeah, brilliant, brilliant, um, brilliant tip there. Thank you, Sheila. Isabel, what about you? Any, any, anything you would recommend? So um, what worked very good in our case was to have both um, top down support, but also um, bottom up interest in the topics. And something that we did very early on was um, similarly to what was described just now to reach out to individuals interested in the topic, but also into uh, 
for individuals who might block that topic and to try to address their fears and then establish a regular, could be monthly, bi-monthly um, working group where we just meet like we do here for the community calls where people share their inner source challenges from their departments. And typically what we found is that depending on where you look in your organization, people tend to be on a different place on the uh, adoption curve. So oftentimes you will have teams further along who can help those who are um, a little bit uh, more behind. And something else that was very helpful also was to have the InnoSys Commons trainings because we could roll them out internally in order to help people understand what InnoSys is about. Brilliant, thank you, and 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 we'll we'll add the links later. But the um, the inner source learning path is um, can be found on our websites, and I think that's what what Isabella is, is referring to. Also available in loads of languages. The learning path team are doing amazing work in terms of actually making that more accessible to a global audience. So it's fantastic. There are articles there if you don't like videos, um, but great set of resources. So thank you, thank you, Isabel, for 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 reminding us of that because um, there are we're we're here to help you on your journey if you're doing it from a grassroots perspective. So yeah, it's good it's good to. Remember remember that. Um, Georg, what about you in, in terms of well, any tips? So one, one thing is building the momentum and finding the right people to carry the project and who are really passionate about it. And then we get into a stage where we need to maintain that momentum, where we need to show to the organization that what we are doing is we don't all just feel good about it, but we actually are delivering value. And so being able to say, here are some, some metrics, some KPIs that we worked against and finding those success stories and describing them and communicating them. It's, it's almost like doing a little bit of marketing within the organization. I, I think of marketing as communication. And, but you need to be mindful about that and not just do good work, but also talk about it. And if you have the numbers to back up your story, then it's easier to be succinct in that story and be attract, have it to be an attractive story. That's brilliant. And, and I mean, I'll, I'll add into that, like we're hearing reports as well of some uh, folks in inner source program offices, for example, actually hiring marketing professionals to help them with communications in that respect. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a great one to consider uh, a little bit of marketing knowledge can help you on your journey. Um, and, and, and you point to a great point in, or you, you, you've, you've touched on a great point around this idea of kind of measuring the value and things like that. So what I'm going to go to now is, how do you give value back to the contributors or how do you, you know, if you have any tips for appreciating um, the contributor or how you reward them for contributing them to motivate them to do more. And um, so my next question, and in fact, the last question before we actually move into the second part of the event uh, under Chatham House rules is when you're in the process of building a community, can you give one or more uh, top tips in terms of how you actually motivate contributors in your community and how you give back to them to thank them for, for, what, for, for contributing to any inner source project. Sheila, we start with you. Sure. Um, stickers. So stickers. Before, <laughs> always stickers. I, I want to say, I want to say pre pandemic stickers were all the rage. Um, just because like we had an office to go to, we'd order them and then, um, hand them out to people. Um, another thing, uh, but recently what we've been doing is sending an uh, email to, we also ask, so we'll ask a contributor like, Hey, what motivates you? Do you want me to write you? Cause we have a, we have a gratitude portal that we could also use that'll go to the, uh, to the employee and their manager. But also we, we take it a step uh, further and say, hey, do you want us to send an email to your manager and let them know um, all the good work you're doing? Maybe you can carve this out into your future um, roadmaps, into your plans, and let them know how important this is. Um, and then another thing we have done with our uh, users who have contributed um, to our contributors is promote them to maintainer. Say, hey, this is a great way for you to start maintaining this project. We'd love for you to do it. And then, of course, let their manager know how important that is. Um, also gives them a head start for open source, uh, especially for folks who are shy or to get their feet wet into the open source community. This is a great way to kind of start being a maintainer and learn what it's like. I love I that. Ask, all of those. Go on, I want to ask, can you talk more about the gratitude portal? 
How does that work? <laughs> Yeah, we have, um, it's called the thanks portal. It basically has a directory of um, everybody who works at the company um, within the technology organization. I can't say the whole company, but within our technology organization, you can look up the name and you have a certain amount of points that are given to you each quarter. I think, I don't know, 100 or something. And you can you can give out um, these thank you uh, thank you notes in, in, in this portal. And then it gives you the points. And with the points, if you collect enough, you can buy stuff. Oh, um, stickers. No. <laughs> it's like coffee, lunch, you know, all kinds of different options. That's amazing. Thank you. That's a brilliant idea. And and I know there, there are many of the bigger organizations that do that, but I haven't seen it specifically related to, to like projects that you're trying to um, promote like that. And I think that's a, that's a fantastic tool to use. And I presume that, I mean, you don't have to have a portal to do that, right? Like the, the principle is the same that if you, yeah. if, you if you think about that, that give back, I, and I want to add in, I particularly love the idea of asking people what they like. Um, so, so, so we, we often assume that people like that sort of thing. And some people are like, oh, God, don't tell my boss I'm doing this. I'm just like doing it on the side. He'd hate to know that. <laughs> so, yeah. But, uh, but others will love it, right? So <laughs> it's kind yeah. of, some people don't like, um, like we have an open source channel where all of the resource conversations happen as well and there's a large community in there and I have had contributors tell me I don't want to be uh, recognized in that channel I don't like attention or whatever so the person I, I know yeah I, so. I love the idea of, of respecting people in terms of and meeting them what, 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 what they appreciate <laughs> Isabel how about you what, what, what would you recommend in terms of saying thank you um, I would recommend to check out our um, saying thank you pattern ah. um, the one, one feedback that I got when I started at my employer was, hey, you are saying thank you much more than anyone else. And I still attribute that to coming from open source where essentially you pay with saying thank you. And I once at an Apache Con learned a very valuable lesson on how to say thank you, na namely with a qualified thank you. I would like to say thank you because you did, did X and that helped me do Y better. And that helps the person really understand why you are appreciating what the, what they did. It helps them set themselves up for um, other contributions, which go into the same direction. And also, it feels a little less, um, you know, a little less fake, because sometimes, yeah, thanks mm -hmm. can can feel very fake, especially in a pro a professional context, whereas this typically doesn't happen. I, I love uh, that. And, and, and the other thing that I also found was that the intrinsic motivation of participating in the project is the one that keeps people there. Like stickers are nice, uh, sugar on top. And me too, I love stickers and t-shirts, etc. But the thing that keeps people going is that if, if they have the autonomy to, to do stuff and you, can, you give them autonomy by ma turning them into maintainers at sooner or later, and I know that in some organizations, this just isn't possible right now because of how they are set up in terms of um, uh, where headcount goes. But if it's possible, then you totally should. This is something which you should be doing. Well, I think that they are all superb suggestions. So thank you all so much for, for, for sharing those. At this point, I'm actually going to pause and say thank you very much for your contribution, Georg, Sheila and Isabel. We are going to um, stop this part of the event, which is the end of our recording, before we actually invite everyone else from the community to come on board for the for, and to, to turn their cameras back on for the Chatham House Rules part of the, or, the event. I just want to remind people and anyone that might be watching after the fact to know that you can actually find out about all our community calls on the Inner Source Commons uh, website, innersourcecommons.org. And uh, please do come along to one of our next ones. So with that, I'll say thank you all once again. <laughs>